Hello everyone and welcome to the executive summary video for the thermal hydrogen invention drive. My name is Jared Moore and in this video I'll be introducing what thermal hydrogen is, I'll give a brief thermodynamic explanation behind it, and then I'll give you a preview of what you can expect to find in each one of the videos in this video series. All right, and by doing that I'll, I'll give you a preview basically of the implementation plan as well and then at the end, I'll explain why I'm seeking to keep this effort private, um, why I'm starting with crowdfunding or, or a GoFundMe, okay? So to begin with, uh, thermal hydrogen is an energy system which is based upon teamwork, right? So it is envisioned that renewable and nuclear energy will fuel heat-assisted electrolysis, and that will create a chemical energy carrier, hydrogen, for example, and then pure oxygen, all right? So most people think to only do this for the hydrogen, but in thermal hydrogen, we're doing it for the oxygen as well. See, the oxygen is our ticket to increasingly competitive emissions-free fossil fuels. See, all right, here's your basic um, combustion equation here. And when we combust a fossil fuel, we do so with atmospheric oxygen. That oxygen is diluted with nitrogen. So that nitrogen passes through the process and it makes, um, it dilutes the heating, but it also dilutes the chemicals, okay? So in order for fossil fuels to be emissions free, what we have to do is take on this process called carbon capture, all right? So carbon capture is gas separation. So the CO2 is mixed in with the nitrogen. It's a minority of the gas stream, which means we have to perform work in order to separate those gases, right? So that's a thermodynamic certainty. It can't be avoided, all right? So that work, is the vast majority of the cost of emissions-free fossil fuels. And uh, so it's 90% of the cost. So that's, that part is called carbon capture, okay? The separation of the nitrogen. After that, um, all we have to do is compress the CO2 into a liquid. Okay, that'll make it about 400 times smaller. And then, that's, and then it'll be small enough to store underground, okay? So that's called sequestration, right? Won't ever hear from the CO2 again. All right, but in thermal hydrogen, what we're going to do is we're going to um, oxidize with pure oxygen rather than atmospheric oxygen. That's going to allow us to use a more advanced thermodynamic cycle. And then we, can then we don't have to perform carbon capture. We can bypass carbon capture, which is the vast majority of the cost. And then all we have to do is sequestration, all right? That's a mature technology. So I'm sure many people are, are wondering, you know, they're probably saying one of two things. Okay, they're saying, all right, this sounds very complicated. And then secondly, um, you know, if, if renewable and nuclear energy are going to be successful, why are we dealing with fossil fuels? Right, that was, that's supposed to run out, isn't it? So this is exactly the situation that I'm prepared for, and in a way, I fear, okay? because I, mean, I guess people are under this impression that if we are successful with renewable and nuclear energy, that if we meet some cost target, that fossil fuels is just going to go away. You know, it's not going to go away, right? The, when, when we demand less of fossil fuels because renewable and nuclear energy are successful, microeconomics tells us, you know, due to the laws of supply and demand, that the price of fossil fuels will go down as well. So if the price of fossil fuels goes down, then that just means that you know, someone else is going to find it as their least expensive option. And given that um, you know, no willingness to pay has been offered by society, you know, not an appreciable one in, developing, in developed countries, let alone developing countries, um, that means that it'll be in, many, in the best interest of many to use those fossil fuels unabated without carbon capture, okay? Because that requires an extra cost. Right. So, um, you know, people are under the impression that if, you know, certain countries adopt, you know, certain energy sources that it's going to solve this problem, but it's, it's called global warming, right? And fossil fuels are quite portable, so they're just going to find demand somehow, All right? But with this energy system, what's going to happen is um, we'll be, hopefully, over, you know, it's just a matter of time. We're already there with renewables. We'll get there with nuclear since it's millions of times more dense than fossils. Um, but over time, um, this renewable energy is going to oversupply the grid and nuclear will have nowhere to go. 
And um, that will allow electrolysis to be economic, but only a limited amount of electrolysis because there's a limited amount of oversupply. All right, so that's going to put up some pure oxygen and it's a matter of engineering to get that oxygen to the fossil fuel. Okay, so if we can get that oxygen to the fossil fuel, the problem is solved here. Okay, the conflict of interest is gone and you know, it's not that much of an exaggeration to say we save the planet. Okay, if we don't do this, you know, it's obviously up in the air. In fact, I would say it's very unlikely that we're going to solve this problem because uh, you know, there's a limited willingness to pay to keep fossil fuels in the ground and there's a limited willingness to pay to perform carbon capture. Okay? So this system is the only one that integrates fossil fuels, making it increasingly competitive, solving this conflict of interest. And then furthermore, uh, this system will provide hydrogen carriers which mean with, through the fossils, so the fossils provide carbon and then we can also use oxygen as a hydrogen carrier and then uh, we can also use nitrogen as a hydrogen carrier and uh, that'll be enabled by an air separation unit which will be enabled by the oxygen value which has a value because the fossil fuels have been integrated, okay? So by, by integrating fossil fuels, not only do we solve the problem that we, you know, we're, we're here to solve, which is climate change, um, we provide hydrogen carriers, which makes the entire system more competitive because we don't have to distribute pure hydrogen, okay? So here are the claims for thermal hydrogen. It makes fossil fuels increasingly competitive and emissions-free because it does not require carbon capture, does not require pure hydrogen distribution, okay? And so for all of those who are saying, well, this is just so complicated, how can it be efficient? Well, here's, here's why I call it thermal hydrogen, guys. It's because there's going to be some um, excess heat sources, sometimes nuclear, and those excess heat sources find endothermic processes like electrolysis or hydrocarbon reforming or demand itself. Right? So that's how we can keep from wasting heat as we're going through all of these changes. So if we can, if we can accomplish that, then that means only friction holds this system back. Okay, the only other time we need to do compression is to compress the CO2 into a liquid, and that's a, that's a very small part of the, the overall energy picture here. Okay? Uh, for example, the alum cycle only uses about a third of a percent of its energy to compress the CO2 into a liquid. Okay? It's a very, very small cost. Okay? So by and large, we're talking about a system which only has friction holding it back, which basically means it's perfect. Now. We're going to use heat engines still, but we're only going to use heat engines when renewable energy is undersupplied. Okay, so other than the friction of going through these cells and going through pumps, uh, the only inefficiency here is the heat engines, which are only necessary because we temporarily don't have enough renewable energy. All right, so you can see how strong the thermodynamics are of this system and how it's probably going to be inevitable that to solve climate change, we have to do this because I mean, I don't know what people are thinking. Do they think that, you know, we're going to go towards an electrolysis economy, just put up pure oxygen into the atmosphere and leave fossil fuels in the ground? I, I don't understand what they're thinking, okay? So, um, you know, I've, I've had this paper published for two years now. It was peer-reviewed. I've spoken to many people in the industry. No one can refute it. Uh, the only thing they can say about it is that, you know, they don't know how it could be implemented, okay? So that's what makes this one of those opportunities dressed in overalls and looks like hard work, okay? It's, and, and that's often missed, right? It's a quote from Thomas Edison, right? So now what I'm going to do is show you the implementation plan by previewing the videos, all right? So in video zero, I introduce the pipeline system for this economy, all right? So this is the transmission system, and this is what I seek to own privately along with my investors, okay? It's part of the implementation plan because we need the pipeline system to compensate the technology developers, okay? So this pipeline system is going to be a massive continental pipeline system and every continent on earth will have such a pipeline system. And these pipelines will be syngas, oxygen, and CO2. Syngas is hydrogen and carbon monoxide. All right, so these pipeline systems are going to house bi-directional nuclear reactors, right? And that is introduced in video one. So the pipeline system houses the nuclear reactors. Those nuclear reactors are going to supply the grid with electricity when renewable energy supply is short. 
But when renewable energy supply is long, these nuclear reactors are going to go in reverse and purchase electricity for heat-assisted electrolysis. So we've got the cheapest source of heat, nuclear, providing heat for heat-assisted electrolysis, and the cheapest source of electricity, renewables, providing electricity for electrolysis. Therefore, the cost inputs are going to come down dramatically, and that's going to create um, economic hydrogen and oxygen except we're not going to electrolyze water, we're going to electrolyze CO2. That way we don't ever have to distribute pure hydrogen. All right, so in video two, I show you how the byproducts of electrolysis, syngas and oxygen, meet at a reformer block with a hydrocarbon in water. All right, and then from there, we're going to distribute, easy to distribute hydrogen carriers because they are pumpable at low pressure. They're liquids at low pressure. All right, so we're going to distribute these easy to distribute hydrogen carriers, methanol and ammonia, using the existing pipeline system. So we get these hydrogen carriers from supply to demand through the existing pipeline system. And then in video three, I showed you how we can use the methanol emissions free in a plug-in solid oxide fuel cell. All right, so I showed you how we would use this hybrid battery fuel cell vehicle to reduce cost, and then how we would get the CO2 from the vehicle to a gas station, from the gas station to a truck, and from a truck back to the distribution or this CO2 sequestration system. All right, the ammonia is very easy to use emissions free. All you have to do is burn it, okay? It's a replacement for natural gas, and it's easier to distribute the natural gas because it's a liquid at low pressure. So both of the hydrogen carriers are easier to distribute uh, than our current energy carriers. You could argue gasoline's easier to distribute, but gasoline's not fuel cell ready. So we improve our chemical energy distribution system and make it emissions free. All right, so that was video three. In video four, I showed how we could use these three pipelines to make industrial heat emissions free, including retrofits. So we can retrofit an existing fossil fuel uh, system. We can make it emissions free without carbon capture because we can use these things called molten carbonate fuel cells. All right, and those will be fueled by syngas from thermal hydrogen. All right, so that's how we can make industrial heat and retrofits emissions free without carbon capture. All right, so in, the, in video five, I uh, share with you the rationale behind the engineering of these pipeline systems. Why are they located where they are? Well, they're located where they are so that they can get excess renewable energy uh, from supply towards uh, fossil fuel. All right, and you know, we have no trouble finding um, the gaseous and liquid fossil fuels, oil and gas, uh, because they can come to the pipeline system. But this pipeline system isn't designed for them, it's designed for coal. See, those are the solid hydrocarbons, coal and biomass, and that's the challenge. We need to get this oxygen towards a solid hydrocarbon because it's harder to move a solid hydrocarbon than it is uh, gaseous or liquid hydrocarbon. So that's the foundation for this pipeline system is to get from renewable energy to solid hydrocarbons, all right? So it's a vision for coal, all right? And I'm adamant about including coal. I'll explain it in that video. So, and then in video six, um, after I, you know, describe how every continent will, you know, have such a thermal hydrogen pipeline system, I introduce a microgrid system, all right? So this is what would happen if we brought thermal hydrogen down to scale We'd use a concentrated solar power dish, and we would use um, probably a liquid hydrocarbon, oil, propane, or, um, or diesel, propane, or gasoline. Okay, so this is how we're going to get Africa started, and then later on, Africa is going to be connected to um, a continental thermal hydrogen pipeline system. So in video seven, I bring together how the market would work for such an economy. So renewable energy would cause volatility, and the significance of that is that it would help nuclear in this situation because when renewable energy is gone, nuclear is going to enjoy a healthy margin. And then when renewable energy is oversupplied, nuclear energy will again enjoy a healthy margin because it can buy cheap electricity for heat assisted electrolysis. All right, so nuclear energy is uniquely benefited by this energy system because it makes more money off of volatility, not less. That will reduce its finance cost, which is very important to nuclear energy because it's so capital intensive with a long lead time. Okay, so now that you've seen a preview of the overall video series, you can see how central these pipelines are uh, towards for distribution, uh, but they're also uh, central for uh, implementation. See, 
I don't plan to develop these technologies myself. I plan to sell the licenses for these patents to those technology developers which would agree to only use my pipeline system. All right? So that way um, I can have a mutually beneficial agreement with the technology developers in that I know that I'll have a technology developer and they'll know they'll have a pipeline system to connect to. Okay? And that's also the reason why we need to keep this private because if someone else gets a license like the United States government, well, you know, that will then take away from the exclusivity of my pipeline. Okay. And furthermore, if a government gets involved, they're probably going to constrain suppliers. All right. I don't have the, I don't have the view that everything needs to be developed in my home country. I don't think that's the way to minimize costs. I think we need to make this project international so we can bring down costs the most. And by getting everyone involved, um, I think they'll be more likely to do this voluntarily. All right, especially, you know, it's on us to make it in their best interest. We can't use force. So um, that's why I'm seeking to go this route with the GoFundMe, with the crowdfunding. And, uh, you know, since I'm asking for money, I think I should introduce myself because, you know, people don't invest in ideas, they invest in other people. All right, so my name is Jared Moore. Um, I got a mechanical engineering degree in 2008. I specialize in thermodynamics. I went to this great school called Rose Holman. And uh, from there, I uh, was, in the, was in the field for a couple of years. Um, I was in the wind and solar industry, and, and mainly what I worked on was um, I was a, a solar developer's consultant. Okay, So that's how I got introduced to renewables, and then from there I went back to school. I went to grad school, and um, I got a PhD in engineering and public policy. And there I specialized in electricity markets. Okay, So that's how I know so much about markets. And then after that, I used my expertise you know, from, from markets, from, from actually being a developer, and then also my thermodynamic background uh, that I uh, specialized in and, and when I was an undergrad in mechanical engineering, combine those skills to create an independent consulting practice, which is what I've been doing for the past five years here in Washington, D.C. All right, so that's how I've had the time to come up with these inventions, and that's how I funded the first patent application. All right, so I have a proven method because um, I've already applied for a utility patent. I've already received um, an official report from the International Patent Office that they have um, recommended that these are novel and patentable ideas, and they have recommended that I apply in member countries. Okay, so I don't have the funds myself to apply you know, for, for, for these patents in every member country um, all over the world that respects patent property, patent or uh, intellectual property, and let alone I don't have the funds to apply for uh, the other inventions. So I've only applied for the first four inventions. I also need to apply for 31 other inventions. And then, you know, contingent upon that being successful, then I need to apply for every single country uh, with, you know, the utility patent, provided we get a positive report. All right, so all of that funding is beyond my means. And uh, I'm looking for help from uh, GoFundMe or crowdfunding. Uh, because I'm seeking to keep this effort 100% private, basically. So uh, that's my you know, global implementation plan and what I would hope to do if this GoFundMe is successful. Okay, so uh, that's it for this executive summary, guys. Uh, thank you so much for, um, for, for listening. And one more thing, um, for those that, um, those that donate uh, greater than $1,000 or more, I'm offering this com commemorative mug here. It's a thermal hydrogen mug. And, um, you know, if, if you donate more than a thousand, um, please email thermalhydrogensponsor at gmail.com and tell me uh, where to send this mug, okay? So once again, guys, thanks for your attention and uh, hope you enjoy the video series. Thank you.